Hi Bahamas, just give me a second, just waiting for a couple of people to join. Hi Bahamas, this is Alan Johnson. It's been a while since I did a Facebook Live and I think it's time for me to begin to talk again. You know, we are in a unique uh, circumstances in the Bahamas. Um, I don't know if the government has said anything to anyone, at least I have not heard uh, anything coming from the government in regards to our particular position. You know, uh, we've never been where we are today. And chances are where we'll be going tomorrow. Uh, we are in a state of crisis, no matter what the government has said or failed to say concerning uh, concerning it. As a part as part of our economic outlook, uh, one of the things that we we hear the political parties and uh, the FNM, the PLP, and the DNA in opposition <clears throat> speaks to uh, the the perilous things that we have uh, we need to have done. Now, but one of the things that I, as a, as a futurist and a technology person, have begun to realize is that nobody's speaking about the future. Nobody's speaking about what's now or what's next. Everyone is talking about, look how this one is doing is failing, or look how this one is failing. The government is talking about technology, but not talking to what it is we should be doing. You know, we hear government talk about the green economy, the blue economy, the orange economy, the knowledge economy, uh, the digital economy, and the conceptual economy. There's plenty of what's, but no one is telling you how, and no one is telling you who will be doing it. These are unique things. These are things I've been advocating for over a decade, and so this is nothing new for me. People, these are new buzzwords for people. These are things that I know how to do intimately. So when I tell you I have not heard anything, I have not. I've heard digital education. I say none exists. I'll give a reward to anyone who could bring me a white paper or a blueprint on how we will do education going forward. None exists. There is no nothing that one functioning aspect of the digital economy in the Bahamas. There is not a single government ministry who can show you a digital infrastructure that functions the way digital works. We have government agencies that can't even give you a digital document. We have 30,000 individuals in the, in the public service, whether through uh, P and P, uh, pension, uh, what's it, what's it, permanent and pensionable contracts, uh, temporary, whatever you want to call it, government agencies. No one has brought a strategy as to how we will sustain these individuals. Now, let me give you, I want people to understand and, and I'm here to speak the truth to you, and it, and it may be scary, but it says that you cannot manage what you cannot measure, and you cannot measure what you refuse to acknowledge. And the point of that is that we saw during the budget debate in the month of June, the government of the Bahamas made uh, a statement to you. The government of the Bahamas said that we will be, we will be starting at negative $1.3 billion. And now let's, let's understand that we have a, a budget of less than $3 billion per year. So we're starting at $1.3 billion short. So if we round that up to uh, $3 billion and you, and you, and you take uh, $1.3 billion into that, you're literally starting at more than 33, more than one third short, closer to 40% short. So how do you run with one third short? But here's the problem. We have to ask uh, the question we have to ask ourselves. Because a lot of time we talk about government shortfalls and government uh, uh, budgets. But we have to understand where government gets its revenue from. Government, our government at least, have no uh, 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 revenue that's generated from profits, from investments, and such. Government gets literally 100% of its, its revenue from taxes taxing the behemoth people. So if you look, and, and I'm going to try to simplify this, you know, not to anything. If you look at the 
at, at what is our stated uh, GDP of $12 billion. So we could very easily say that if the government itself uh, gets its uh, revenue from taxes alone, and you have $12 billion, then on average, the government collects 25% in taxes. So 25% of the $12 billion is $3 billion a year the government collects in taxes. Now, this is very important for you to understand the $12 billion GDP and the 25% average in taxes, just to make it simple, that the government collects. So let's begin. If the government starts at collecting $3 billion from a $12 billion economy, and then the government starts at negative $1.3 billion, immediately the government is recognizing that 4 or $5 billion from the economy will not come in. Just imagine this now. So here it is, we have a $12 billion economy. So we are starting with, the, with an admission due to Dorian or to uh, uh, COVID or whatever, whatever excuse you want to use, that we will start at negative $5 billion from the economy. So that, that automatically puts us at $7 billion in, the, uh, in our economy. So here it is that government is saying, oh, we're only going to have a $7 billion economy. Just let me get some light. So we're starting with a negative $5 billion has disappeared from the economy. And that's very easy to, under that's very easy to understand. Remember, Grand Bahama and Great Abaco, the, the two Gs, accounted for 25% of the GDP. So automatically, Dorian wiped out 25% of our GDP, which is $3 billion. So it's very easy to understand where $5 billion has disappeared from the, from the, from the GDP. Hence, our problem begins. Now, according to the government anticipated revenue stream, the government then was looking of taking in probably about $140, billion, $140 million a month uh, from revenue going forward. But where does the revenue come from? 70% of our economy, directly or indirectly, depends on tourism. As we know, COVID has killed the tourism. It's dead. Not 90% not, not dead, not 50% dead. It's 100% dead. Dead, 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 dead. Okay? So that tells us that 70% of us would eventually be unemployed or, or whatever. That's another crisis coming because that'll add a crisis of housing, that'll add a crisis of food, it'll add a crisis of, of just basically people surviving. But let's come back to the economy. 70% of the economy has now disappeared. So if the government was started at negative $1.3 billion and every month the government does not, the, the, the economy does not return, we can add, let's round it off at a low ball figure, $125 million deficit to the 1.3 we already started. We started at negative $1.3 billion, $1 billion, $300 million. So add $125 million for every month the economy don't open. Okay, we already know July is already gone. We look at the major hotels in town and they're already in, in October, November for opening. So let's, let's just put four months. July, August, September, October. That adds $600 billion deficit because we have no new money coming into the country. So it adds a $600 billion deficit already to the $1.3 billion that we anticipate that we are not going to make. Okay, that puts us at $1.9 billion over an expected $3 billion in revenue. Now, so that means if everything goes perfect, and we open in November, you know, open when influenza season starts and the second wave or third wave begins, then we could probably make it on the $1 billion or whatever with borrowing some more money. But the reality is we have no replacement economy. It's going to take, using the old methods that we've been using, it's going to take a few years for us to return to 219 uh, periods of economic activity. 7 million visitors to be bragged about, 5 million on cruise ships. You know, the cruise ship business is gone till next year, period. So, boom, the 5 million tourists is gone. So let's look at our, our strong base of, of 2 million tourists. That is not going to be returning anytime soon. We have no alternative models to replace. We have nothing further now, 
and we have heard nothing about the next. Now I want you to understand, we, I'm not talking just about FNMs, you know. We have a government in waiting, you know, they're waiting to be government. And that's both the, the PLP and the DNA. They are waiting to be government. The proper definition is that you should be government in waiting, meaning that you should have plans, you should have ideas, and whatever it is that you have to institute. If you're not hearing from the PLP or the DNA or any other political party that emerges, what are their plan and strategies? Not ideas now. Ideas are like assholes, okay? Everybody going to have one. Can't help it. So the question then becomes, what are the implementable strategies that we could use right now? Because Bahamians don't want to wait till 2022 and another year after that while you say, oh, the FNM laid the country all messed up and uh, you have to sort things out. We don't have three years to sort things out. Bahamians are going to be facing housing crisis. They're going to be facing health crisis. They're going to be facing uh, uh, food crisis. So we need actionable plans right now. The Prime Minister has some economic response committee or recovery committee. Can't believe that we're going to wait till the end of September to suppose you bring the ideas and then we'll discuss it and then we do whatever. That's like saying the house is burning and we're going to have a meeting as to what we're going to do while the house, while we in the house burning down. Madness. So we have to begin to demand more from our leadership. There is some short gap measures. Now, I have ideas and everybody have ideas, but here's one of the biggest problem about ideas and, and government asks for input. Imagine that you have no understanding of the economy. You don't know the revenue. You don't know how the, the business uh, classes are inter, uh, interconnected. You don't know anything. And I walk up to you and says, guess what? The economy has collapsed and I need your ideas to how I can restore the economy. Really? You really want uninformed, unequipped, unaware individual to give you ideas on how to fix a country while you're the government of the country that we are paying millions of dollars for to you, the civil service, and to your consultants. I mean, the prime minister have tens of millions of dollars in the, in the, in the uh, OPM budget for consultancy. You got companies with less employees than we have people who have less budget than that to adjust for the cold COVID crisis. But we can't come up with a solution of 30,000 people working, the prime minister office with million dollar consultants sitting all around the table. And then he goes outside and tell the blind people, not literally blind, but the blind people to please tell us what to do. Can you imagine? I want any of you to tell me, tell me how you could come up with an idea, or not an idea, an actual strategy of writing the economy. You can only say, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do whatever. How do you do whatever your idea that you have? I want you to add up how much of the 120,000 individuals your idea would put to work. We don't even have access, you know, to, to, to financing. MSMEs is called uh, micro, small, medium enterprises. It's the strength of an economy. We never built that. What we built was plantations. Atlantis and Bahama and Breezes and the rest of them. And when the plantation masters shut down, the slaves on the plantation was left with nothing to do and no strategy on what to do next. We have to rethink what we've been doing in the past. We cannot go back. You have the Economic Response Committee in the Prime Minister's office who's seemingly trying to resurrect the dead. It's called the old economy. The old economy cannot be resurrected. The world has changed. The Bahamas was at least a decade behind in technology. What do we have? The world has catapulted itself a decade into the future. That puts us 20 years behind. And you ask yourself, and, and let me explain to you as a technologist how, what that means. You have technology companies that woke up from COVID trying to readjust their strategies. Imagine that the very companies that you're depending on to build the future themselves had find themselves adjusting. Why is that? Because generally speaking, technology companies, uh, technology involved, the evolution is between 12 and 24 months, 18 months on average. So imagine, technology companies had planned for three in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, incarnations of adv how technology advanced. That puts them five years ahead. Bam! They go to sleep and they woke up 10 years in the future. So that put the average technology platform in the world five years behind. 
So they're now running and adjusting to the new reality of technology. And we're trying to come to where the world has left. That, that won't work for us. We need innovative, bold ideas. We need, in the Bahamas, what is called moonshot. We have nothing to lose by doing a moonshot. A moonshot is where you basically, you know, remember when America went for the moon and they just simply went all out? We need moonshots in the, in the green economy, the blue economy, the orange economy, the large economy, the digital economy, the conceptual economy, and, and whatever other economy names you want to come up with. Because you can come up with all the fancy names. If you don't understand what each one of those is, it means absolutely nothing. I have some ideas myself. I'm going to talk about it. I invite you to like the page and to share the page because I'm going to start talking. I, don't, I haven't set a time yet. I, don't, I haven't set a time yet, but I think it's going to be about 2 p.m. daily, and I'm going to made that decision by tomorrow that seven days a week 2 p.m i'm going to begin to have a conversation you could send me your questions you could whatsapp me 443-7189 tell me what you want me to talk about tell me how you want to explain things i may even do multiple uh facebook lives so i could talk on very small subjects especially for small businesses that is looking to get into the business i've I, i've i'm going to go back into the small business consultancy I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin to talk to you concerning what is necessary for you to become digitized. Now, for those of you who want to engage my services, that's a separate WhatsApp number. I will give a free consultation, tell you what to do, telling you how to access the $55 million that's available for MSMEs, medium, small, micro, uh, uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises or businesses. Uh, there's $55 million that's available. Many of you can get into business with five and ten and five thousand and ten thousand dollars in these so-called economies they, they they name. And the easiest way uh, to do that is that you have to understand that it's something that many of you already possess. Intellectual capital. You know, when you go into the SBDC or the Access Accelerator or to the bank, there's never been a person in the Bahamas that has been able to quantify and qualify something called intellectual property. That is where, for instance, you have an idea. Let me use an example. I, I know I'm getting off the economy, but you know it's just kind of like flowing for me. Use an example. You want to get into the lawn care business. You've been doing lawn care maintenance for 20 years, just as an example. And you want to start a business, and you need, let's say, $100,000. $100,000 to start this maintenance company. Generally speaking, you would go into the into this into the bank or to the small business assistance center and tell them that you want this twenty this hundred thousand dollars to start this lawn care maintenance company. Immediately, the SBDC or the bank says to you, "Okay, good. We need you now to come up with twenty five percent or twenty percent, whatever equity skin in the game." Now, let me tell you why that's a disingenuous uh, concept, and we need to begin to give credit for your intellectual ca capital. An intellectual capital is where you basically quantify what is it you bring to the table. Here's why. Take you who have 20 years experience in the painting business or, or in the lawn care business or the, or the automotive business or whatever it is. And you go to the bank and they tell you to bring your house property and your land paper and everything, bring 20% down. That's wrong. I, I'm, I'm going to be able to quantify and qualify the intellectual capital. What do I mean by that? If you take $100,000 worth of equipment, randomly pick somebody off the street and said, here's $100,000 worth of lawn care equipment. Here's $100,000 worth of painting equipment. Here's $100,000 worth of mechanical equipment. Go start a mechanic business. Even if you give them 100% financing, they would look at you like a madman. Like, what I can do with this? I don't know anything about lawn care. I don't know anything. So, but if you give it to you with 20 years experience, you're bringing what is called intellectual capital to that equation. That's what I'm talking about. Because you could start on day one right away with the information you have for that business. So that's intellectual capital. That has a value. So if you had given me the $100,000 worth of equipment and I need to hire you, say for $40,000 a year to run the company, because I sure don't know how to run the company, that means that you have a value of $40,000 that you should be able to go to the bank and put against that $100,000. Times that by what they call EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, and amortization, whatever it is, times that by five, that means that you're bringing $250,000 to the table. So why is it that behemoths aren't allowed to bring intellectual capital to the table? We have to change this. And so I want to 
be able to, to, to begin to give advice and get people to quantify the qualities they have. Intellectual capital is currency. The knowledge economy, the digital economy, the conceptual economy, it's all based on intellectual capital. But you need somebody to quantify and qualify it. We don't have anybody in the Small Business Development Center or in these banks that actually advocate for this. In fact, so I'm going to begin my advocacy for this. And so it's a separate phone number. You can still try me at, at my WhatsApp number, 443-7189. But there's very specifically, there's a phone number being set up, 825-9300. That's a WhatsApp, 242-825-9300. You can give me a call on New Providence. You can also call me directly from a landline phone, 698 If you're on Grand Bahama, you could call me at 688-9300. So it's all 9300. 825-9300 for my WhatsApp. 698-9300 on, on New Providence for my uh, direct line. And 688-9300 on Grand Bahama for my direct line. And I'll be able to provide my consultation service. It's absolutely free for the free consultation. The advice and the direction I will point you is on the way. If you want to see me, if you want me to work with me, I, I guarantee you, I, I, I promise you, I'm going to try to stay as close to $100 as possible for your consultation. Just because I have some light to pay and, uh, and, and, and children I like to eat. And I kind of like, with the heat coming, I need an AC. So, but for $100... And if, you, if there's any other additional fee and you're going to go fill out a business plan, I am so assured of making sure that you get approved for your business plan. I'll put my fee in your business plan. You pay me the $100 a month as you work on it. You got to have some skin in the game. I'll put my fee in your business plan. And if you don't get approved, I don't get paid. <laughs> Can't get better than that. That means I have to make sure that the only way for me to get paid it's for you to get your money to start your business and for you to be successful in your business. Totally unique, totally different than what other people do. This is not make-believe. Now, back to the Bahamas economy. Let me tell you why it's going to be important for us to get involved in small businesses and the likes. When we go back to the fact that we're going to be about $2 billion short, and I don't care what, I want you to show why it's very possible that we can almost be as close to the $3 billion short. Because this is the one point that you miss, and I want some of you, if you missed what I was talking about, go back. $12 billion economy, government collects 25% tax on average for the $3 billion budget. Here's the problem what government doesn't say. If government is $2 billion short, so that would mean that government had no money to tax. This is the scary part. That would mean that $8 billion has disappeared out of the economy. Stop. How does that, what do you mean disappear? It means $8 billion of the $12 billion we were expecting or the salaries and profit will not show up. I want you to imagine that you're, you're at home, you're making $300 a week, and I snatch $200 a week out of your income and send you home at $100 a week and says, I want you now to live. I want, to, I want you now to imagine the entire bohemian economy with $12 billion, $8 billion has disappeared. Government can't tax it because you don't have it. Guess what that $8 billion used to do? That $8 billion used to pay for your rent, used to pay for your children's school fee, used to pay for your clothes. Is to, it, that's the $8 billion you used to pay for your light. That's the $8 billion you used to pay for your phones. That's the $8 billion you used to pay for your car. That's the $8 billion you, paid, you used to pay for your phone. So it's a scary thought. Forget the government deficit. You're facing a deficit of income in the Bahamas. But the FNM and the PLP and the DNA are not speaking on this. They're speaking on, oh, look at this one is messing up and this one is messing up. We need to have a conversation on what are we going to do to rebuild that $8 billion dollars that has disappeared on the economy because it is those that's dependable that's depending on tourism or those that service tourism who's going to be without work for months so we need to we need to be able to churn some ideas and some things to be done you know the government's borrowing money to pay bills but no one is talking about borrowing money 
to build some institutional income revenue generating things. Not, and I'm not talking about ideas that's approved for family, friends, lovers, supporters, or finances. I'm talking about people that are capable and competent. Investments that is capable to sustain, my, sustain itself and is capitalized in such that if somebody fails, it is not a direct hit. I'm not talking about collecting money, a few billion dollars, and just giving it to people and say, try this, hit or miss. I'm talking about taking some actionable ideas. I'm going to talk about some ideas concerning the economy. And, and I'm saying because we, we can rebuild this economy. I've studied this economy for 20 years. When you hear me speak, anyone hear me speak, I don't need notes. I am well aware, I'm passionate and informed about whatever I speak for. When I speak, it's because I have something to say. Unlike others who speak to say something. I make sure that I'm informed. And here's the good thing about me. I never argue for something I can't argue against. I never argue against something I can't argue for. If you can't argue for something and against something, it means that you have insufficient information to prove you have competence in it. How could you argue a position against a position I have and you don't understand my position? That's the power of debate. We don't see that in Parliament. So the point is that I know the green economy. I know the blue economy. I know the orange economy. I know the digital economy. I know the knowledge economy. I know the conceptual economy. Like here, like here, front of my heart or the back of my heart. I know it. I need no notes. I need no reference point, And I can debate anybody on it. 20 years of studying it, 40 years of living it. When I say 20 years of studying it, I'm talking about it in the context of the, of the Bahamas. I've advocated for every major change that has occurred in the world. I've advocated for it in the Bahamas before it happened. So please, Bahamas, I ask you, like my page, follow my page. If you don't know all of my locations on social media, all you have to remember to find me on every social media platform, Allen, A-L-L-E-N, C, Johnson, dot com. Allen, C, Johnson, dot com will take you to every digital platform I have. Maybe 90% of them. Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, TikTok, uh, uh, LinkedIn, whatever there is. Allen C. Johnson dot com, A L L E N C J O H N S O N will take you to them. Follow me, share it, tell your friends, tell your family. We are about to change the Bahamas, one person at a time. We're going to build some families. I'm going to, you know, you know, it's going to, we're just going to blow a lot of y'all away. When I take the time and explain to you how to rebuild the tourism economy and the behemoth economy by making sure that 20,000 individuals are put in brand new homes. This is not no government home. I'm talking about real homes, three bedrooms or larger. Three bedrooms, two baths, two and a half baths, four bedrooms home. But every family, we're gonna, I'm going to show how the only way for us to restore the economy is to immediately put 20,000 people in some brand new homes at zero cost. Zero to you. I'm going to explain to you how that's going to be achieved. You get to live in a three-bedroom, two-bar house, a four-bedroom, three-bar house, or whatever, at zero cost to you. This is what innovation, this is, the, this is the position the Bahamas is in. I know a lot of you say, impossible. Well, test me on this. Like the page, share the page, tell a friend, tell a family, tell them. I want you mostly to tell my enemies. And for those of y'all who want to have a debate with me, please, don't bring your political colors. And don't bring your political signs to an intellectual fight. You'll be, out, you'll be intellectually out number by one. Don't come on behalf of your leader. Send your leader. Okay? This is a fight about intellect. This is a fight for our country. This is not time for you, family, friends, lovers, supporters, finances, or whatever definition you carry yourself in. We have no time for that now. We have a country in crisis. We must begin to rebuild. This is about leadership. A lot of you will say, oh, we have a leadership crisis. We do not have a leadership crisis in the Bahamas. We have a crisis of leadership. There's two. Leadership crisis is when there is no leaders in the country. A crisis of leaders is when the wrong leaders is in place or the right leaders are unable to get there. And they have done a number on us. 
they have created what is called identity politics in the Bahamas. It's a conditioning process. You must belong to one or the others. You know what, what happens? Then they force you to, collect political, to elect political parties, not leaders. Notice what we've done. We've elected the FNM or the PLP for 50 years. We've never elected leaders. No, let's bring that back to 30 years because in the past, when we remember, I want you all guys to remember the, 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 first, uh, the first set of uh, PLPs, any one of them could have been prime ministers. They were leaders. They didn't go into the House of Assembly and read notes. Uh, they didn't. They went and spoke from the heart. They, they spoke about a country they believe in. They spoke about a future they saw. Not some script somebody's reading. In fact, the rules in the House of Assembly prohibits reading. But what you saw for the last 15 years, people reading from a script. They have no idea what they're talking about because you have elected political parties. You've never collected, uh, uh, put people in parliament. It's time for us to put leadership back in parliament. It's time for us to embrace leadership in our country and leadership in our country, in our, in our, in our islands. Stop voting political parties. Don't let them brag, but if they send a dog to you, you'll vote for it. If you can't find competent leadership in your neighborhood, then you're in trouble. Each one of us have about 10,000 people in our neighborhood. If we can't find one person who's competent, don't let's confuse qualifications with competence now. Because we got a whole bunch of qualified people in the House of Assembly today with very little competence in what we need them to do. Minnis has proved he is one of the most qualified gynecologists, OBGYN, whatever it is in the country. But his competence in leadership can be questioned. The same thing. Jeffrey Lloyd talked. Technology, technology, technology. Nothing he says makes sense. Nothing. Okay? So we have plenty talking. Marvin Dames, we had great hopes for him. It seemed to me that when it comes to solving crime, if you was to paint crime on the bottom of an empty box, he couldn't locate it. Because we selected political party. We have allowed them to create an identity politics regime in the Bahamas where you must select political party. This is why you never hear right now today in the Bahamas. You hear people, you never hear people saying, oh, let's, let's, let's get rid of this person or that person. Get rid of the FNM and elect the PLP. Get rid of the FNM and the PLP and elect the DNA. How about saying, get rid of these old ideas and embrace these new ones? Because they have no ideas for you. They have no development ideas for this country. Do you believe, no, let me use a biblical principle. What parent would have a child ask for bread and you give them a stone? Who would actually have their children be hungry and be hurting and will ignore them and say to them, until I put myself in a better position, until you do whatever, then I'll help you. It's garbage. If the PLP has ideas for the country, let them put it out right now. We need it. We don't need it. You think we're going to forget that they were the ones who presented the idea that got us out of the trouble? Here it is. The FNM is in the driver's seat. Do you honestly believe that behemoths will say the FNM had no ideas? And so the PLP came up with these wonderful vision and ideas that we could implement to save the country. And we can say, thank you, PLP, for your ideas, but we want to stay with a visionless, driverless organization? No. We will understand and appreciate at the time when we needed leadership the most, you stood up, Mr. Brave Davis, and presented the vision and the ideas that saved the country. And we'll ask you to continue to drive the car. Ms. Kamalafi, if you have some ideas and a vision for the future, I ask you to express it. Don't tell me I must elect you first and then you'll tell me. No, you tell me of your competence and your ability to see into the future and describe how we're going to get there and who is going to get us there as part of your team, then we will accept you. It's the same thing for you, Mr. Brave Davis. It's time to stop telling us how bad the FNM has done and tell us how good you will do. Plain and simple. Let's talk about tomorrow. Let's de redefine what the Bahamas is. Let's begin to talk to individuals, Bahamians, so they can see how they fit into this new Bahamas. Because the old one has died. As the title says of this, the two Gs, Grand Bahama and Great Abaco. 
The hurricane has devastated us before COVID did. I want you to go back. I'm talking about the time that I've been home. In 2007, Hubert Alexander Ingram, the Right Honorable Hubert Alexander Ingram, got up on the stage and preached, there can be no Bahamas recovery without Grand Bahama playing the central role in it. Five years go by, Grand Bahama, nothing happened for us. Nothing happened then, nothing happened today. Nothing ha you could almost say that nothing has happened for Grand Bahama except smoke and mirrors for 25 years. Smoke and mirrors. Everything they give us has been smoke and mirrors. Please, don't talk about the harbor, because the harbor was a sucker deal where we forced them to build the hotel that from day one, the government of the Bahamas subsidized. Yes, that hotel has never made it on its own. And if we said, if we force them to build a plantation, in exchange, we'll give you the harbor and the airport. That hotel has never made a, made a profit. The government has subsidized the hotel and the casino from day one. So please, don't talk to me about no casino, no shipyard. The shipyard and the poison and the things that we've done to our people, it's garbage. We've had no development on Grand Bahama in 25 to 30 years. And for those of you that understand what you say is done, don't tell me about what somebody told you. Don't come to me with what you feel, what you was told, what you believe, what you pray for, what you hope for. Come to me with what you know. Because I'm coming to you with what I know. And I can prove it and substantiate it. Okay? It's tired of us talking about, well, I feel, well, I believe, well, I hope, well, I'm praying for, well, I'm wishing for. No, let's start building on what we know. Because that's what the rest of the world is doing. The rest of the world is building on what they know. So please, go back to the beginning of this if, you can, if you're just joining me. But Grand Bahama is hurting. But going back, 2007, Hubert, the Right Honorable Hugh Alexander Ingram said, there can be no Bahamas recovery without Grand Bahama. And he's absolutely correct. I challenge anyone in the Bahamas who can bring a national development plan and show me where Grand Bahama doesn't play the primary role in our development and recovery, and now Abaco. It will not happen. The recovery of the Bahamas starts on Grand Bahama. And if anybody else tells you anything but that, if the Economic Recovery Committee come back with that, you tell them they're liars. And tell them to call C. Allen Johnson a liar. Guess how many people they put on the Economic Recovery for Grand Bahama? One, the Chamber President. Of all the 100 people or whatever they have on the Economic Re Recovery Committee, one, one person from Grand Bahama. I don't even know if they have one person from Abaco. That tells you something is wrong. But let's go back. The Right Honorable Perry Glass on Christie in 2012 when he mounted the stage. You know what he said? There can be no economic recovery for the Bahamas unless Grand Bahama plays the central role. Well, let's ask what happened from 2012 to 2017. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, guess what? 2017, at the time, Hubert Alexander Menace, now the most honorable Hubert Alexander Menace, got up on the stage and he says what? There can be no economic recovery for the Bahamas without Grand Bahama playing a central role. Well, you have three prime ministers. Three of our most current prime ministers all said over the last 15 years, there can be no economic recovery for the Bahamas without Grand Bahama. To that, I asked the second, I had the second G. Great Abaco and the Keys and Grand Bahama, two Gs. That's where the recovery for the Bahamas is. No one else, don't let no one else tell you otherwise. Don't fall for it. I'm dying to see this economic recovery plan that they say they're going to bring in September. I'm dying because I see no consultation on, on Grand Bahama. The poison to this has been political parties and an emasculated organization on this island called the Grand Bahama Port Authority they serve no use. They're good for something, good for nothing. That's what they're good for, good for nothing. The Grand Bahama Port Authority has moved into a position of intellectual piracy and prostitution. Two piece. All you have to do is go downtown with a broom and sweep the streets and the Grand Bahama Port Authority will show up and, and congratulate you and say how things are happening on Grand Bahama. They can't name you a single idea they've brought forth to this island in 25 years. So why do we give them the $150 million a year in tax breaks under the Hawksville Creek Agreement? 
Name one thing. You can't name a single idea, initiative, or investor the Grand Bahama Port Authority has initiated or brought to the table in 25 years. Please tell me. You can't. The Grand Bahama Port Authority does not exist except in the mind of those who have been indoctrinated to believe they, they exist. The Grand Bahama Port Authority serves no purpose. The water, that's the only thing they can do. They tell us that they give us salt water. They knew from 2008, because I got a copy of a report showing you on how the well fields will get flooded and damaged, because it happened in 2004. And they knew and did nothing about it. And in fact, the Grand Bahama Port Authority, with all the revenue source from the water company, is a bankrupt company, because they done sold all the other assets under the Hawksbury Creek Agreement. We can have a talk on that. For all these individuals who are proponents of the Hawksbury Creek Agreement, the law exists. But the infrastructure to support it doesn't exist anymore. Because Grand Bahama is the grand deception. You guys, when we have this conversation, and I break this down for you, you're going to understand why fixing Grand Bahama destroys the oligarchs. Why fixing Grand Bahama destroys the plutocrats. And why they will only talk about it, but they'll never do it unless you demand it. It says that power concedes nothing without a demand. To that I add, power will never concede to the demand of an emasculated constituent. You can't demand nothing of me, and you can't like, demand nothing of government on your knees. You gotta stand up. You can't come to me, please give me my things back on your knees. Yeah, I look at you like you're crazy. Power concedes nothing without a demand. And power will never concede to the demand of an emasculated constituent. You cannot demand nothing from me or from government on your knees. So we must demand accountability. We must demand the truth about the Grand Bahama Port Authority. Who have, you know what? Do you realize the millions of dollars of damages that, is done, that has happened on Grand Bahama by the salt water intrusion into people's houses? I'm not talking about the flood from the hurricane. I'm talking about the water that the Grand Bahama Port Authority pumped into their houses. Salt water for months now, and they knew, but they took the profit out because that's the only way for them to survive. They didn't sold the power company, they didn't sold everything. So the water was their means of revenue. This is why they have to start. They wanted to say they want to charge just for salt water. Legally, how could if legally the Brand Bahama Port Authority is obligated to give us portable water? How could they send you a bill for salt water? Tell you that if you want drinking water, that you got to go to the pumps. The whole island. You know, you guys in Nassau talk about the people in the, in the inner city have to go to the pumps. Guess what? The Grand Bahama Port Authority had the whole damn island go into the pumps. And we still go into the pumps. That's why I don't know how this lockdown administers planning it. I'm hoping tomorrow he's telling us the grand things that will happen for the two Gs, Great Abaco and Grand Bahama, that we can focus on building the economy rather than running to Miami bringing back COVID. I can tell you a lockdown ain't going to do. I'm going to listen to that, and then I'm going to tell you what it is. But going back to the economy. Sorry, I keep getting distracted. There's so much to talk about, and this is why 2 p.m. every day, I'm going, to be, I'm going to start coming to you. And we're going to talk about home ownership. Because home ownership is the means to stimulate the economy. Hope, H-O-P-E. Home ownership promotes empowerment, H-O-P-E. That's what we're going to start with. We're going to show you how home ownership will promote empowerment. And I'm going to show you what a sovereign wealth fund should be doing with home ownership. Here, uh, the, the, the right honorable Sir Lyndon O'Pinlin had it right with the hotel corporation. He was ahead of his time. You know what the problem was? When the world went digital in 1992, we didn't digitize the hotel corporation, meaning the new economic model. When the world went digital in our in people to people now known around the world as air air bed and breakfast airbnb we didn't digitize it we owned it first people to people it's just that notice what happened the first digital revolution started in 1992 it literally ended in 2017 25 years so we are now three years into the second digital revolution we did nothing 
in the first digital revolution as the world slowly digitized. We saw all the things that we did digitally, you know, typewriters and all those things became computers. The dial phone and we could pick up the phone and walk with it and all those different things. You know, cellular phone didn't exist. We saw the world went digital and we sat stagnant because they were so satis satisfied with the plantation. We could catch up. The Bahamas is the most digitally prepared country in the world. We can catch up because while most of the world is now attempting to build a new digital infrastructure to adjust to the new digital shift that happened because of COVID, we already have the highway built. We sold, no, we give away 51% of it. Now you have to remember, the same guys in the House of Assembly is the one who give away BTC. But we could build a better one. Notice how the world is now accelerating in the second digital revolution, and you have the company, the people who sold or give away BTC, and now we have Cable Bahamas, Alive, uh, uh, BTC, and believe it or not, the Broadcast Corporation in the Bahamas is also a telecommunications digital infrastructure. They're laying off people and they're firing. Wait a minute. The world, is accelerating to, the world is accelerating to digital, and we have Cable Bahamas laying off. We have BTC laying off. We have a live struggling, and we have the Broadcasting Corporation not functioning. How is it the four individuals, the four vanguards, guardians of the digital infrastructure of the Bahamas is struggling for their position in the world that's going digital? They should be expanding, not laying off people, not letting go people. Because how do they shrink their staff? Over there, you have the four people, the Broadcasting Corporation in the Bahamas, Alive, BTC, and Cable Bahamas is shrinking while the Prime Minister is standing up screaming, we're going green, we're going blue, we're going orange, we're going knowledge, we're going conceptual, and we're going digital economies, all requiring their infrastructure. <laughs> the Broadcasting Corporation I think, should be the guardian of the orange economy practically you have all these guys so something is wrong with that picture you can't be saying one thing while doing the same thing you can't be telling people to take unlimited baths while turning off the water it tells you that our leadership have no idea of the present not less the future that's where we have to, converse, have to go to the conversation let me say it to you again Stop electing political parties. What you have is incompetent soldier crabs that crawl up into these shells called political parties. And so you elect them and they have no quality. They're just like soldier crabs or hermit crabs, whatever you call them. They don't build nothing. They go and occupy shit. We need leaders in this country going forward. Political parties, identity politics has hurt us badly. We must now begin to choose competence from amongst us, those that is capable of knowing the future or listening and adjusting. All show list to the wheel. We don't need people to hide behind political parties. We need leadership that knows and understands the future. We need leadership who can adjust and understand very quickly what needs to be done by those. You see, don't believe that the, 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 the titans of the world like uh, 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 Elon, uh, Elon uh, of, of Tesla or uh, uh, the leader of, of uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg or, or, or Amazon, Jeff, Jeff and all the rest of them. Don't believe they're running these companies. What they have is the ability to recognize and bring people around them to build these, com to build these companies. That's what we need. We need people in our communities who can recognize the, the, the quality within that community, utilizing their, themselves as leaders and bring them to build the community who will then build our islands, who will then build our country. Political parties never built nothing in this country. Political parties never built anything in this country. For those who want to speak correctly, didn't. People did. Let me give you another point. Do not fall for the bullshit 
that these people running around saying you need to make it on your own because they did. Let me talk to Brent Simonet, Frankie, and all the rest of y'all who are successful people. You made it on your own. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, how many of you paid for 100% of the goddamn roads? How many of you paid the salaries of all the police officers? How many of you built the goddamn airports? How many of you paid to build the harbors? How many of you paid for the roads that you drive your trucks and supply truck on? How many of you paid for the security that's given through the country? You didn't build shit by yourself, man. All of us did. You have the benefit of it. And we're going to have a talk about you paying your equal share in taxes. That's another one of my conversation. So don't give me this crap about I've made it on my own. No, you made it with us. You made it off us. We can need a conversation with you on how you made it with us so we can begin to get our fair share. Equity. Equality and equity. We have to fight for it. We have to allow what is called real conversations. We have not been having these things. We've been allowing political parties to drive us to identity politics. If you don't have on a shirt, you have nothing. Those other people out to get you. And if you don't support us, no matter how bad we treat you, we can do whatever. Let me talk to you too. First of all, let me, you know, while I'm on this, is that they didn't build themselves? Listen to me, please. When you are prime minister of this country, you are responsible for 39 constituencies or whatever amount there is. So when people begin to say that this person ain't build a community, this MP ain't build a community, no. The leadership didn't build that community. You know why? Because identity politics allow them to say, because you didn't support my party. Imagine that you chose somebody that you thought was best for you, and they punish you for that. That's what they did, you know. They punish you because you did not support their political party. As prime minister, I'm responsible for every man, woman, child in this country and making sure that they get equality and equity across this entire island. If I am in, in, in Central Grand Bahama and you an f &M government and I am, for the, use, for the sake of this political party, a PLP, why would you ignore Central Grand Bahama? They have just as much right to empowerment, to development, to education, to health, whatever else is anyone else. So whenever you see a community has not been developed, it is not the MP, because he has no control of the budget. It's your goddamn leaders. It's cabinet. They allow you to blame people, the blame party. Most of these constituencies has been represented by both people. Only a few of them have not have had ex exclusively one person. Then look at your community and says, oh, this is an FNMC. An FNMC? But just use that as an argument. Then why, if the FNM, for at least 15 years in the last 30, well, why that community hasn't been developed? It's a PLPC. Let me ask you a question. Why for 15 years of the FNM, that seat hasn't been developed? Well, let's go back to when the PLP had it. Well, why you didn't develop your seat? Because they have allowed you to take responsibility from cabinet. They have allowed you to take responsibility from government. And notice what you do? You blame political parties. And so now you get to say, well, it wasn't me. You know, you know what Brave Davis get to say now? Well, it was the party. It was, it was, you notice how they say, he didn't do it. But when they time to the election, they say, elect the party. The FNM say, they didn't do it. Elect the party. Cabinet does it. That's who's responsible. Governance. We need to elevate our conversation. But I want you to understand, Grand Bohemians, you are a fighter. I want you to understand behemoths as a whole. You have a fighter. You know why? There can be no economic recovery of the Bahamas without Grand Bahama. Grand Bahamians, if you want us to lead the development of the Bahamas, we need five. Let me tell you what I mean by five. You need five MPs. From us, by us, represent us. And we're going to begin to redesign and rebuild Grand Bahama because we're going to move all of the people from New Providence and this is where you guys in New Providence come in. Those 20,000 homes that I say that we're going to need to build to, re re to restore the economy, we're building them in Grand Bahama. So if you want a free house, come to Grand Bahama. You want a job in the future, come to Grand Bahama. We're going to empty New Providence. There ain't no room for the building in New Providence except more plantations. 
we're going we're gonna to empty New Providence, knock down a whole bunch of stuff and rebuild it, and we'll see if we can go back there, vacation or something. We're going to build a new city in Grand Bahama. Singapore, which is about 30 square miles smaller than Freeport. Notice what I said. It's smaller than Freeport. We love to talk about Singapore. Singapore and Freeport is the same size. I didn't say Grand Bahama. I said the area of Freeport is the same size as Singapore. They got 6 million people living there. We got a better harbor. We have better airports. We have better geolocation than why don't we have it. Same thing with Hong Kong. All the places we admire. Grand Bahama in 1955 was designed for 250,000 people. The very infrastructure we're using today that has yet to be improved. And for, I, you know what pisses me off too? When you grand behemoth, when you non grand behemoths who have never been to Grand Bahama start talking about how wonderful Freeport is. No, you need to tell them how Freeport used to be. Because our roads are falling apart. Our infrastructure is really falling apart. So you are talking about the past. But we're going to rebuild Freeport for the Bahamas. As soon as we get rid of that good for nothing place, the pink building that doesn't exist except in the mind of people. And the conditioning about the Hawksburg Creek Agreement still functioning the way it is. It's all a lie. We need to get rid of them. We're going to ask for the McKinsey report, the digital report. All of these things we're going to ask for coming up. You know, all those reports they've been hiding. The Freeport, Freeport, the Hawksburg Creek Agreement called for land reform. It called for land registry. We ain't got it yet. Because once you get a land registry for Freeport, you must have a land registry for the rest of the Bahamas. The Hawksburg Creek Agreement called for municipal government. They gave us some fake thing. Municipal government is where 50% of your revenue and all that stuff stays on the island. We ain't got it yet. All because they keep plugging the thing. They've been lying to you about the Hawksburg Creek Agreement being modified. The Hawksburg Creek Agreement has never been modified since 1955. Don't let them lie to you about these so-called tax concession. They've been passing laws to delay the implementation of the things the Hawksburg Creek Agreement called for. We have never extended the Hawksburg Creek Agreement. The Hawksburg Creek Agreement is a law. You cannot fix or change any law until you first strike down the old one. So that means we have never struck down the Hawksbury Creek Agreement. So that means the Hawksbury Creek Agreement has never been modified. Don't mind the double talk. I've heard people talk about it all the time. They talk around it. The tax, it's called for August 15, 1990. They're supposed to start paying real property tax. What do we do? We pass a law to delay that part of the agreement. We didn't pass no law to fix no Hawksbury Creek Agreement. We delayed it. Then we passed another law, delayed it again. Hubert Minnis says he's going to repeal it. Ain't nothing happen. Because if you repeal it, the power comes to the people. We're going to talk about energy. We're going to talk about education. Not that garbage Jeff Lloyd talking about. I promise you, it ain't going to happen. We're going to talk about policing. We're going to talk about border patrol. We're going to talk about, no, not border patrol. We're going to talk about border control. We're going to talk about how to fix our workforce and eliminate the 40,000. We can eliminate the 40,000 people in the Bahamas in six months. And guess what? We don't have to deport a single one of them. They'll leave on their own. Do you know why have you fixed the immigration problem? It comes back to the very thing I talk about. You can't fix immigration until you fix affordable housing for Bahamians. So we talk about shanty towns because Bahamians won't break the law. They do it. But behemoths have been living in shanty towns for years. We don't have no affordable housing. We don't have proper housing for behemoths. So how about building affordable housing for behemoths? And just like in Singapore and all those places we admire, there will, no, there will be no work permits giving in this country unless it accompanies a housing lease contract and a lease and a contract for their children for school and health insurance to cover them. Why? Because you as a behemoth, you have to pay for housing, you have to pay for insurance, and you pay for, for, for whatever your taxes. So why we can't ask for individuals who's coming here to work, the person who, if you want them to work, then pay for their housing, pay for their whatever. And if you really want to prevent in your development, then let's begin to work. Can we say people can get college degrees in four years going off to school? Technology now, to us to give qualifications in three years. Well, why for 20, 30 years later, we still have people doing the same jobs? Why do we have 30,000 illegals in the country working? Why do we have 40,000 work permits? Because we have leadership that under, does not understand ownership. 
that doesn't understand development, we must shift our conversation to bohemianization that has never really occurred. We could fix all of our problems with some minor fixes. Because if you make it illegal, just use an example. You talk about border control, where you make it illegal for a company, let's say $5,000 fine for you to hire somebody illegally. C. Allen Johnson works at the business with you. All I have to do is when I find an illegal person working, I pick up the phone, call the immigration hotline. Immigration will come and fine and, and charge that, that business owner $5,000. Guess what happens? We're going to tell every Bahamian or every legal person in the country, every time you report a person working illegally, when the fine is assessed, you get 20%. You get a grant. We almost don't need immigration officers except to pick them up. Because everybody at the job site can be looking, they can be like, hey, see, Alan, you got your paperwork yet? I go, nah, man, I'm still waiting on it. Give me one minute, I got to make a phone call. Next thing you know, I, I'm against the wall. There's somebody going to call me in to get that grant. That's all you have to do. Just some little simple things. Make us all police, make us all immigration officers. Make us all custodian. But when somebody's coming to the country to work, let's set a salary. Let's define every single job in this country by a legal digital definition. 808744, that tells you, okay, technology. That tells you the qualifications for that job. It tells you the qualifications. They can't add Spanish or French or whatever else to it. Because it tells you what the qualifications is. You can't add no additional or take away. You, now, so you have a base pay, $30,000. Okay, good. So now when you say you need a worker for this, 808744. We know automatically that's a data entry, whatever. Guess what? You can't have Spanish. You could pay them extra for being able to speak Spanish. But you can't tell me it's an absolute requirement in an English-speaking country that a person need to be speak Spanish to end do data entry. These are things that we could fix. The United States and other countries publishes DVDs with every single definition of a job that's already published. Just pay four hundred dollars for the DVD. That's why when you go file up for people in America who know their taxes, every person who file a tax in America has a definition of self-employment or job. This is where you, what category of jobs you fit in. They already prepared it for us. We can do it. But we can't do it with the old mindset. Mars Monroe said, and not it's taking a little long, but Mars Monroe said that the old wineskins, the old ideas would no longer fit. He wasn't talking about an instant, you know. He was talking about the future. We are to that point right now. And guess what? The ideas to take us into the future is no longer in the minds of the old people, the old minds of the past, the leadership that brought us to where we are today. Just challenge them to tell you. Just let, tell them talk about technology. Most of them will tell you. You hear them in parliament all the time saying, I don't even use phones. I don't use technology. Hey, I remember the Minister of Education holding up an airpiece, talking about revolutionary, an airpiece, an airpiece. The world has went to Bluetooth. He was holding up an airpiece. Not even Bluetooth, but you put it in your air and it connected talking about technology and advancement. We can't allow this to facade. If we don't know, let's admit we don't know and get those that do know. And when they are critique, not criticized, but critique, tell them to answer people like C. Allen Johnson when he says there's no educational platform existing in the Bahamas. What, you're, gonna, you're gonna pretend that we have an education platform prepared for September and deny, you got children and you're gonna sit quiet and not demand, show it to me, give it to us, let me feel it, smell it, touch it, let me critique it. it does not exist. You're going to pretend that the parties right now, PLP, FNM, or DNA, has a solution for the COVID crisis that's hit our country? Let's not pretend. It doesn't lie in those individuals. The collective intelligence that we possess is greater than any one of us individually. But it requires us to also lay aside the very thing Miles Monroe said. He wasn't just talking about leaders. Miles Monroe is also saying that the ideas that we held on to for the past, the plantation, is no longer valid in this new dispensation of global economics. Technology has torn down our borders. We talk about WTO. We're not talking about people coming now. Technology has torn down the borders for us to reach into the world, for financing, for whatever it is, except we have leaders that don't know that. They are creating things like currencies and payment wallets that is in a sandbox. 
we need to eliminate that. We need to talk about real economics. We need to talk about building the Bahamas. This is why I told for those who miss it, I said on my on my page, 825-9300 is my business WhatsApp, 443-7189. If you have an idea and you want to know how it fit into the future, you want to know how it fits into the green, blue, orange, digital knowledge or conceptual economy or how to take that idea you have and digitize it, I invite you to reach out to me. Consultation is free. As, as much as you I can accommodate, I will see. Uh, once I initially, I, I probably won't work no more than 100 people at a time. If there's a charge for your business plan development, I'll put it in your business plan capital. So guess what? If your business plan working with my company, if your business plan doesn't get approved, I don't get paid because I require the Small Business Development Center to put in there a consultant fee so that you could pay me. So, I mean, if I don't get your business plan approved, I don't get paid. Can't be that, right? You don't get your money to start your business? See, Alan don't get paid. He wasted a whole month, two months, whatever it is, developing it. So, I'm only going to take those that are sincere and have real desires to, uh, to succeed. But I'm going to show you where many of us can build our country together, we come together as a collective and put political parties aside. Begin to choose individuals who's best for us. Grand Bahama, we are the key to the economic development of this country. The growth that is necessary on the instant to put people back to work is on Grand Bahama and will come from Grand Bahama. And if the five MPs and the three senators and the five cabinet ministers now, I think we got five cabinet ministers. We have, let me see, we got Crazy Thompson, we have Michael Pintard, we have uh, Peter Turnquest, we have a parliamentary secretary called Bakisha Parker, we have a parliamentary secretary or whatever you want to call him, by RM, what do you call him? RM Do Nothing Lewis from the Dis Minister of Disaster. He's not definitely not disaster recovery. And uh, uh, we have uh, Senator Darius. And okay, we no longer have uh, K. Fob Smith. She's there to assist the minister to create disaster. They definitely have not done rebuilding or recovery. And I would challenge them to bring your records, publish it. And, and, and so, as I wind up, right, I want you guys to sit on this. I want you to consider this. I want you to consider this. And this is very important to me. As we move into election time, this is what we like to hear. The free national movement came in on a platform of transparency, accountability, integrity, anti-corruption, and freedom of information. That's transparency, accountability, integrity, anti-corruption, and freedom of information. But I want you guys to think deeply on this. I, I, I know what they told us in the past. The PLP promised it to us. And the FNM promised us. But I want you to focus on this for a moment. Just This is very important to me. I want you to focus on this for a moment. I want you to look for leadership in 2022 or sooner where you need no law to be enacted to make them transparent. We need no laws. Let's choose leaders where we need no laws to make them accountable. They become accountable just by the virtue of who they are. I want you to think about this. I want you to imagine that we could find people amongst us who don't need a law for them to have integrity. Don't you think you have people amongst us where we don't need to create a law so they could be not so they don't have to be corrupt? Don't you think we have at least 40 people amongst us that we don't need a law for them to give us freedom of information just to make it available? If we need a law to get leaders who will provide transparency, who will provide accountability, who will come with integrity, who will not be corrupt and give us freedom, freedom access to information, then we are country in trouble. Imagine the PLP and FNM saying, I will pass a law to force me to be transparent. I will pass a law that forces me to be accountable. I will pass a law that forces me to possess integrity. I will pass a law 
that forces me to be not corrupt, anti-corrupt. I'll pass a law that forces me to give you access to information that I have done on your behalf. What type of country that you need laws to force your leaders to be transparent, to be accountable, to have integrity, to not be corrupt and give you access to the decisions they make on your behalf. If you need, if you, if you, if you, if you have political parties that you need to pass laws to force them to do these things, then we're in trouble as a country. Is there not 39 of us who meets that five definition of transparent, accountable, possess integrity, not corrupt, and will provide you access, freedom of information to information? We, we, don't have, we don't have 39 of them. But well, what about a simple majority? We don't have 21 of them. We don't have 20 of them. If we don't, if we don't have one of them in each community, we're in trouble as a country. If we don't have one of them in each of our community, we're in trouble. We don't need to judge them by their past. We need to judge them by their present and their future. We need to rethink what we've been doing. Stop electing political parties. Political parties have done nothing in this country. The last time something happened in this country is when we had leaders who happened to be in a political party. Then we abandoned electing men and women and started electing political parties. That's why we are where we are. So let's go back to what used to work. We collect men and women of integrity, men and women who wanted to be accountable, men and women who was not corrupt as the ones we have today, men and women that give you access to information that you knew at the time you want. We need greater access. Men and women who are transparent in what they do for you. People who will develop behemoths. We can make literally, let's, let's, let's aim for a goal of 1,000 new millionaires over the next 18 months. We say we redesign the economy, right? We have to redesign the, the, the uh, tourism economy and the financial service economy and all these things. You're saying to me in this country, remember now, if you have a $12 billion economy, which is the GDP, something has to happen to generate that $12 billion of salaries and profits. So that means in the background, there's multiples of billion dollars happening in this country. We have been noticed that we have a $3 trillion economy according to WTO documents. So that, that is happening. So you're telling me in a country of 250,000 adults or 200,000 people in the workforce that we could have a $200 billion economy in the background generating 12 to 16 billion dollars and we don't have at least one two three four five new millionaires a year something wrong with that because those who made it through the door first locked the door behind them because they didn't seek to make other leaders they seek to become our masters COVID Dorian first and COVID has torn open the gates let's not remain in the plantation Let's redesign a new Bahamas. And for those at the two Gs, as this thing says, let's have a conversation on designing the, 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 the Bahamas of the future. And it starts with Grand Bahama. Smart communities, smart cities, a smart island, and eventually a smart Bahamas. A technology-enriched environment that the world has just opened up to. We're going to redesign the tourism product. We're going to redesign the financial services product. We're just going to redesign the economy from Grand Bahama. We're going to purge that pink, useless billing. That's all it is, a billing. There's nothing coming out of there. There's nothing going in there but our money. There's nothing coming out. You know, for those of you all who have licenses in Grand Bahama, you go to the government for the license. You go to government for permission not to pay duty. And you pay the Port Authority thousands of dollars for what? For nothing. It's a facade. It's smoke and mirrors. I'm saying it has to it has to be torn down. I'm going to set up the Project Hope. 
And for those of you, I need you to join me. I'm going to take my time to explain to you. And HOPE stands for Home Ownership Promotes Empowerment. In the new economic model, home ownership is a mandate. And I'm going to talk to you on how we're going to build these homes. And we're going to put people in those homes using the new, the new model. And, and an example of that is for those on Grand Bahama with the digital infrastructure, uh, boy, I don't have a CPU. Just imagine a CPU, just putting, the CPU is the bottom part of the computer. Let me just pull this up right quick for you. Okay. You have something the size of this in your house, okay? That's all you need to have in your house. It isn't a computer for you to use. It's actually a data center. And you don't store data they back up data to your data center. And let's say, uh, and, and around the world, do you know if you put one of these in your house and you have a power supply that it never goes down and the data is just backed up there for you, you know, for people around the world as part of a network. It's encrypted and everything. You don't ever know what's on your, on your computer. But what happens is you have 500, 1,000 of these, 10,000 of these in every home. They pay you $500 to $1,000 a month just to put this in a corner in your garage or somewhere. They pay you for these. People around the world get paid for this. So if you have a mortgage, but you're getting paid $1,000 for keeping this just in the corner in your house and the data is put there, and let's say you know, a lot of people can say, oh, a hurricane will come and destroy it. Guess what you do? Because everything in your house is now digitized, your paperwork, your documents, your insurance, everything, all you have to do is make sure you take your family and this piece of device with you. It's, it's backed up, but just to save it, just, just what you do. You carry this with you or maybe when a hurricane is happening somebody comes by and pick it up because we only need to have it out of your house for two days just to make sure it isn't destroyed it'll be in a in, in, a, in a fortress because they don't need access to the data it's only a backup of the data for these servers that are all around the world and a day or two later is they only need it in case their system suffers catastrophic collapse and we just take them and put them back in place for those houses that's not damaged or whatever. Or we have this secondary system where, you know, you never want all the data in one place, but we know that this is extenuating circumstances. We put the data in this fortress, plug them all back in so the data is still available while we rebuild. And after we rebuild, we take them back and put them there. It's a little, a little strategic planning. But this is how you end up at your free house because... By paying for the same internet service you have, paying for everything else, just put this in the corner, the same bill of electricity, it's like leaving a 200 watt bulb on in your house to, uh, in, in, uh, in the night. And technology now even less than that. So you just, it just runs. You don't even know it's running. And it gives you $1,000 a month. That, put that towards your mortgage. And it's the same thing when you begin to talk about the various tourism models and the development of the Bahamas. So in essence, once we put these down and quantify and qualify these can happening, you could just come to Grand Bahama, get a quarter acre lot, build you a nice house, live in the house. I'll tell you the other revenue generation stream that the world is using. The Bahamas is the only place, one law has to be passed for data sovereignty so we could literally legally protect the data. And it's just one law. The, 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 the FNM has been trying to do for three years, which should have taken three to six months to do. Just pass the law, and those of us who knew what to do would do it. The, the central bank governor said that data must be taken out of the Bahamas for safety? Really? You're going to send the data? You said because of hurricanes in the Bahamas, but less than 300 feet from the ocean in Miami... It's the 10th largest data center in the world, the NAP, N-A-P, the Network Access Point of the Americas, whatever it is, the NAP, Equinox, or whatever they call it, is sitting there with all the U.S. personal data for some of their armed forces and their security clearances sitting in that same building. Just like the Bahamas, it's susceptible to hurricane. You build resilient type environment. These are blind people have no idea, screaming, we must take the data out of the Bahamas because it's not going to be safe. The data is not in the Bahamas anyway. You, you, when you upload to the cloud, it's not technically in the Bahamas, but we could put it in the Bahamas. It takes a little longer. They just, they don't know what they're talking about. They, they really 
don't know. We're going to move it so we have to pass laws so that the data could be safe. What data? Technically, it might be here. It might not be here. They can't quantify or qualify what data is physically in the Bahamas. Definitely, the bank data is not in the Bahamas. And most of them is financial services. They must be talking about government data. And government ain't got no data. They got, government got paper. But we could become a digital society. Grand Bahama, prepare. The revolution has begun for the Bahamas. And it begins right here on Grand Bahama. Because Grand Bahama, as the Right Honorable Hubert Alexander Ingram said, the Right Honorable Perry Glassman Christie said, and the Most Honorable Hubert Alexander Miller said, there can be no recovery in the Bahamas without Grand Bahama. Now we're talking about the two Gs. Great Abaco and Grand Bahama. Let's rebuild together. It's possible. In the ending, let me say this. For those of you who have ideas for developing your country and developing your personal, your personal economy, remember this. If you see it in your mind, it exists. It is impossible for you to see what don't exist or you're greater than God. I think about that. It is impossible for you to see something, even if it's in your mind, that does not exist or you're greater than God. The difference is when God says it, it becomes. You have to work towards it, but God gave you the power of creation. And just that's why people say, you know, when people say all the time, I hear the pastor say all the time that, oh, why can't God lie? Uh, because it's not in his nature. Can you imagine God has a nature that he can lie? Think about that. No. The reason God can't lie, because whatever he says becomes. Pretty simple. It doesn't take no rocket science. Don't mind the pastors there. The, the pulpit pimps and other things that you call them. We can talk about them too. The pulpit pimps, the political pirates and the parliamentary prostitutes and the political prisoners and all those other peas that are with us. We can, we can have a talk on those too. This, all of those has served to, to the detriment of us. The pulpit pimps and the, pol the parliamentary pirates and the political prostitutes that are, supports them making us political prisoners has been our problem. We're going to have a talk about that because we must come to recognize what we have. It says, you cannot manage what you cannot measure and you cannot measure what you refuse to acknowledge. And the ending, this is the, this is the Baptist ending. For those of you, and we talked about choosing leadership that possess integrity. I want you to look at this. People often scream, Oh, they damaging my they damaging my uh, 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 my character. Bullshit. No one in the world can damage another man's character. No one. You can tarnish his reputation. No one in the world can see another man's character. Impossible. The only person who can see character is you. You get the only person who can see your character. Reputation is what others think of you. Character is who you see in the mirror. No one else who you see in the mirror. So I can't damage your character because I can't see it to damage it. You know who you are. So when you start talking about character, I ask you to make sure that your character matches your reputation because a lot of us have reputation that doesn't match our characters which brings me to the closing point here it is often said that power corrupts and this is an original quote from 30 years ago when i heard the bullshit story about power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely bullshit power does not corrupt nor do absolute power corrupts absolutely you sitting for this one? Power reveals who they pretended not to be. Power reveals character. It doesn't corrupt it. It reveals it. 
And so what it does, it causes them to be who they are. An absolute power brings out the deeper part of who they are. So do not repeat power corrupts, nor absolute power corrupts absolutely. Remember, power reveals. You cannot take a man with integrity and give him power and he changes. Most people, if the power would cause them to feel challenged in who they are, they won't accept it. But those weak people, you know those weak ones who wanted to be disgusting and nasty? You remember the ones like the, we, I used to express, we used to beat them up in school, now they police officers with badges, and they now could come and push you around, okay? That's what power does. Power is like the police badge. The little soft guys in school all now got police badges. You know who I am? I'm a police officer. I got gun. That's what power does. It reveals who they are. They want to punch back. They want to push back. So if you see someone in the House of Assembly that's corrupt, that is not who they who they are, that's, that's exactly who they are. They were pretending. Now they get power. They can reveal themselves. And when you take it from them, you'll see them ball back up in a corner somewhere. Because you have power. You lend it to them. Technically, you give them authority to utilize the power for five years. But guess what? We will create a system where we can start giving our power and give them the authority to act in our behalf. Because we're going to choose people who's from us, for us. Thank you so much for joining me. Please share the video. For those of you who want to follow me on all of my social media thing, as it's telling me streaming out my Twitter account, my Facebook account, my uh, my Pinterest account, my LinkedIn account, allencjohnson.com, A-L-L-E-N-C-J-O-H-N-S-O-N.com will give you a link to all of my account. I ask you to like my page, follow me. The conversations begin. I'm going to, like I said, 2 o'clock every day. I'm going to try to make these in... I'm going to get some bullet points. I don't just run on like I did tonight. And 30 minutes. For those of you who want to uh, involve me with business, contact me at those numbers or WhatsApp me at 825-9300. Let's have a conversation about building your personal economy. That's what I'm going to be calling it. We're going to build some PEs. We're going to build some personal economies. There's $55 million available in the SBDC the, the, the development bank and other places. We're going to show you how you could crowdsource some information. We're going to show you how you can get that home that you've been praying for. We're going to show you because see, prayer without works is dead. And so you have to work towards getting it. So we're going to get all of these things. And these things are simple. And I don't need to be your prime minister to do it. I just need you to join me and support me. Question me. I don't want you to accept what I say without challenging it. Test the spirit. Test me. Let me show you who I am. Thank you so much for joining me. For those of you who missed it, I may have said some points in the beginning. And recognize our economy is in trouble. Our economy is in trouble because we are not $2 billion short of revenue. The government is not short $2 billion of revenue. We are short 8 to $10 billion in the economy. That's 8 to $10 billion that's supposed to go for salaries, that's supposed to pay for light, supposed to pay for phone, supposed to pay for water, supposed to pay for mortgages, supposed to pay for car payments, supposed to pay for school fees, supposed to pay for food. It is no longer coming into the Bahamas. So we don't have a deficit problem in the Bahamas budget. We have an $8 billion crisis in the economy. And that is what we have to fix. Thank you. I love you all. I have fought for you for a decade and a half. I'll never stop. I'll never be corrupted. And we'll have a conversation on that part. Love you. Thank you so much for joining me. Bahamas, see you tomorrow at 2 o'clock.